Let's slam these ghosts into the netherworld, bitches! Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. Today's video is a special one. Not just because it's one you guys have been asking for for a long time, but it's also unbelievably the 20th anniversary of 13 Ghosts. Good lord, I feel old. For a refresher, this remake is all about a family that inherits a strange and ornate house from their eccentric uncle. The house turns out to have a mind of its own, as they soon find themselves trapped inside, encountering powerful and vengeful spiritual entities, along the way uncovering a master plan behind the house. For a bit of interesting history, this is a remake of a 1960 film from William Castle, a massive producer and director of the era that I always kind of think of as the schlocky Hitchcock. He made tons of genre movies around the time, and many boasted some kind of gimmick to lure the audiences in. Things like chairs hooked up to electrical shocks to simulate an earthquake, or people dressed in rubber monster costumes to frighten the crowd. There Teen Ghost was all about the ghost viewers. Brave audience members were given a viewer with red and blue filters that allowed them to actually see the ghosts in the film. Most scenes were black and white, but scenes showcasing ghosts utilized an in-house process called Illusiono. See, very, very gimmicky. Everything except the ghost in frame had a blue filter applied, while the ghosts were superimposed with a red one. The red side intensified the appearance of the spirits, while the blue removed them entirely. All of that to say, that the remake reimagines the same concept in a really cool way, where now the characters must don special glasses to actually see the ghost. An actually quite impressively creative way to repurpose and pay homage to an important aspect of the original. Of course, it's radically different than the original in pretty much every other way, as to be expected. As far as this remake is concerned, there are a few things that help this to stand out as a potential new classic. The set design of the house is incredible. Everything is glass, as with intricate writing everywhere allowing us to see everything at all times. It's just a very unique and interesting design visually for a haunted house that still two decades later feels very modern and unmatched in the genre. Even Roger Ebert, who hated the movie, praised the set design. Is that good? The other thing that really works is all of the ghosts. Quite important for a movie called 13 Ghosts, each of them has a very specific and distinct design, all done practically from the legendary KNB. They even bothered to give them each elaborate backstories that explain their respective of appearances, but of course there's no time to go into such detail in the movie. Luckily a feature on the DVD fills us in on all of their missing backstories, so we can go into all of that in depth for each. So let's dive into 13 Ghosts, breaking down the story as it unravels into its grander design, including the history behind each and every one of the ghosts, as well as explaining how things turn out in the end. At a massive junkyard, a semi rumbles up and crashes through the gate, flanked by more black cars. People rush out, clamoring that they only have a few minutes. They pull out a kind of recording machine and set up some speakers. A fancy looking car rolls in and outsteps the dignified looking Cyrus, along with his twitchy pal Dennis. He apparently has some kind of psychic abilities, complaining that his head hurts, feeling like he's breathing down my neck. Cyrus orders the others to hunt down their guests. Dennis, about to take some pills, gets them knocked away by Cyrus, scolding him that he knows the rules and needs him clear headed. First things first, he growls. He tasks him to find the ghost they're tracking, and he puts his hand to the ground and has flashes of visions, a man seen screaming, and other weird distorted images. Dennis freaks, dubbing Cyrus a son of a bitch, as he learns the ghost they're tracking actually killed 40 people, but he only said nine. Only nine when he was alive, Cyrus corrects. He asks them to bring out the cube, and Dennis sneakily touches Cyrus to see some more psychic images, that of money and a weird ornate looking machine. They capture two others, Damon and Kalina, who seemingly have the opposite intention of Cyrus, wanting to actually free the ghost, calling them people too. Ah, join Greenpeace, he groans. Damon warns he'll never pull off this plan without the right spell and the 13 ghosts. Dennis is confused. 13? You only contracted me for 12. Vowing he's done after tonight. Cyrus firing back, yes, there's one more. Goading, oh, I thought you were a psychic. Could have seen that coming. He calls out to release the bait. Dennis, again baffled. They've never needed bait before. The semi roars to life, shooting out fountains of blood as it drops by. Donning their ghost glasses, the cube is powered up, and they start transmitting over the speakers, hearing a recorded voice chanting in Latin. They follow a force backing up amongst the aisles, and the spirit goes on a rampage. A dude gets lifted and dragged up the side and killed. Another goes to help and gets sucked inside the trunk, his bones breaking and his body is twisted. We catch a flash of the spirit as he throws down a car, killing another guy. He tosses them all over the place, throwing everyone out of his way. Another guy runs for dear life, right into the open 
open containment cube. He too is taken out, but they are at least able to capture the spirit. This spirit, who was once Horus Mahoney, is now called the Juggernaut. Horus was raised by his father, and as a child grew to such frightening height and appearance that he was generally an outcast. His father put him to work at his junkyard, crushing up old cars. When his dad died, he was left alone, and with no support, went insane and became a serial killer. He picked up random people and brought them back here, where he would rip them apart with his bare hands and feed their remains to his dogs, earning him the earlier nickname, The Breaker. What was to become his next victim wound up being an undercover cop, and he called in a SWAT team that gunned him down. He's haunted the junkyard ever since. Hearing Kalina screaming for help, Dennis runs to her, and we see that her companion Damon is dying, damning Cyrus for what he supposedly did, and it didn't look like things turned out too well for Cyrus either. We then move on to meeting the overly happy Criticos family, hearing a child asking to swing me. Their parents watch, looking longingly at them, hearing the wife saying she really loves this place. Also gentle and full of laughs. It's even daddy's birthday. Whoo, I hope nothing bad happens. A fire alarm suddenly beeps, hearing voices to call the fire department, and the kids screaming, where is mom? Where is she? She's still in the house. A firefighter urges that he can't go back in, hearing a monitor then flatlining, and a doctor informing them, sorry sir, she didn't make it. Arthur, full of regret, says he should have gone in, hearing a eulogy and him sobbing. So yeah, his wife died, and the family never quite recovered. Seeing Arthur now looking out the window and much more dour in appearance, a bunch of past due notices littering a board. Uh, I guess they didn't have insurance on the house or something because they're all crammed into a small apartment. Yet weirdly, they also have a live-in nanny? Seems kind of like a waste of money, especially as when Arthur tells his daughter Kathy to let her cook, she smirks. Have you tried her cooking? So wait, a live-in nanny that doesn't really do anything. Cool, sounds good, especially when money's tight. Let's spend our money on that. While little Bobby appears to have grown a death fetish, bringing up a new story about a decapitated body found this morning. Yeah, it's real neat, you little weirdo. Arthur trips on the boy's scooter and loses his temper, Bobby sheepishly apologizing. Kathy chimes in that it wouldn't be a problem if we had a bigger place. Him retorting, this is the best that we can do now. Jeez, what did his wife do? I guess she made all the big bucks in the relationship. Again, no insurance? Whatever. Point being, everything is so tense in the family now, a far cry from before Jean died. Although their fortune is about to change. There's a knock at the door and it's a lawyer Moss, a slick a-hole in a suit. He represents the estate of Arthur's uncle Cyrus, who he says he only met a few times as a kid. According to his dad, he squandered the family fortune. We have a family fortune? Well, not anymore. Moss plays a message from Cyrus, informing them that he's making him and his family his sole beneficiaries, pulling out an intricate looking key, which is to their new house, him calling it the fruit of his life's work. Cyrus says that he's seen some amazing amazing things in his life and has no regrets, except for getting to know his nephew better and appreciating the love of family. Well, isn't that sweet? That's nice of you, Cyrus. Calling the house his attempt to make up for that, concluding, perhaps we'll meet again in another life. With nothing better to do, they decide to go ahead and make the journey out to the estate way out in the woods. And with no neighbors for miles, Unky Cyrus sure likes his privacy, and everyone is hopeful things are looking up. Elsewhere in her bizarre workshop, Kalina appears to be launching her own measures related to the ghosts, seeing pictures adorning the walls and articles recounting their various deaths, and grabs something out of a container, a recording marked drawing spells. Noting the other one says containment. You sure you don't want to bring that other one along too? You know, just in case? Why you want to draw the ghost to you is my question. Unless you can't be trusted. Ooh, twisty. They arrive at the quite breathtaking glass house, each wall inscribed in some kind of writings. The dumb kid Bobby calling it futuroic. While Kathy is hopeful the bathroom is in the basement, considering you can, you know, see everything in the house. Dennis is there in disguise as a power guy, using the line that the house has been knocking out power in the whole area, and he needs to check it out. They try to turn him away, but he's unrelenting, and Arthur steps in to defuse things, warmly offering for him to come inside. He sticks the weird key in the lock, and a mechanism immediately starts ticking, parts on the lock spinning. Inside, gauges activate, the lights coming to life. Dennis jokes, what, you couldn't afford any walls? The floor is adorned with many symbols, and an inner circle starts to rotate. The front door opens and everyone steps inside as it quickly closes behind them. Everyone is overwhelmed by the various artifacts, but Maggie appropriately sasses that she doesn't do windows. Just what do you do exactly is my question. Moss marvels at the house, calling it a living work of art, while Dennis is preoccupied with finding the basement. The sooner he finds it, the sooner he can leave. Bobby razors around, the spinning circle just about to put his foot on it. His dad lifts him away, warning don't touch anything, at least until they get some property insurance. See, 
he does know about insurance. Not gonna make that mistake again, I guess. Dennis enters the dark and spooky basement with even more etched glass walls everywhere in search of where Cyrus stashed his money. He is suddenly bombarded by visions of someone with a cage on their head, referred to as the Jackal. Ryan Coon was born to a prostitute and thusly grew an insatiable urge for women. He became a wild sexual predator, murdering prostitutes in the night like a wild animal, the, the Jackal, hoping for treatment at an asylum. He eventually went insane. It sort of had the opposite effect. He scratched at the walls so much that his nails were torn completely off, making his hands appear claw-like. After attacking a nurse, he was put in a straitjacket and tightened it whenever he acted out, contorting his limbs horrifically. He gnawed through the jacket, so the doctors put his head in a cage-type helmet and locked him in a dark cell, where he grew to hate any human contact. A fire broke out at the asylum, and Ryan chose to stay behind, feeling his fate was deserved. Arthur is taken aback by the place and worried as he doesn't have the funds to maintain it. Everything was lost in the fire. But Moss assures him his uncle was a financial genius, and basically he doesn't have to worry about money ever again. Dennis grabs his ghost glasses, one smashes at the wall with a bat, seeing they're all over the dang place, each held in individual cubes, causing a terrified Dennis to flip out and flee. He runs up to Arthur and tries to reveal who he is, a ghost hunter that worked with his uncle, but Arthur refuses to believe it. Ghost, he yells in frustration. Dennis pleads to get him and his family outside, offering to explain then. Meanwhile, an oblivious Kathy finds her own digs and with a big dumb smile, jumps onto the bed in a needless slow motion shot. <laughs> yeah, what the heck was that about? A little overly dramatic. Dennis tries to bring up the containment cubes and how they're filled with violent spirits down in the basement, while Moss excuses that he's been harassing the office and believes that Cyrus owed him money, which it seems is true. Dennis spitting, he owed me a shitload. He's floored by another vision when touching Arthur's shoulder, that of Gene burning in the fire at their old house. He croaks, he's going to get him some help, Arthur bristling, don't touch me. Dennis dribbles, only starting to steady himself when they realize Moss has gone missing, and he's down in the basement of spooks, seeing tons of glowing riding on the ground. He encounters the next handful of our contained spirits. First, the kid with the bat, the torn prince, or as he was known in life, Royce Clayton. Born in 1940, he was discovered to be a gifted baseball player in high school, despite some potential superiority complex personality issues. He was offered scholarships from various colleges that allowed him to leave his small town. Yet fate threw a curveball in his plans when he was challenged to a drag race. But unbeknownst to him, his opponent had cut his brake lines. This resulted in an accident that tore flesh from his chest and face, and soon ended his life. Next up is a kid with an arrow through his head, the firstborn son, in his life, Billy Michael. Obsessed with western films, he wouldn't allow anyone to keep them from him. A joking neighbor taunted him to a duel, and Billy armed himself with a toy gun. However, the apparently quite sadistic neighbor was playing for keeps, using steel-tipped arrows, and shot Billy through the back of the head. And finally, as perhaps the most complicated for me, feelings-wise, the angry princess. Moss even complimenting nice tits while he walks by. If you were a confused teen as you're watching this, I'm sure you also had complicated feelings for her. I mean, it's like she's hot, but she's dead, and she wants to kill me, which is maybe even hotter. I'm not sure, but I, I just feel bad about myself now. I feel wrong inside. And her story plays into these desires. Dana Newman was beautiful in life. According to Cyrus himself, had the looks of a goddess, but she was unable to recognize her own beauty. Her self-loathing and self-esteem issues were only made worse by a series of abusive boyfriends that led to her having several unnecessary cosmetic surgeries. This ill fated quest for physical perfection was her undoing. After trying to perform a surgery on herself, it went horribly wrong and left her blinded in one eye. She then gave up on beauty entirely and committed suicide in her bathtub with a butcher's knife and bled to death. Moss continues to another room and discovers Cyrus's stash in an attache, but raider style when he lifts it, it causes a lever to move and another circle starts to rotate, implying someone has bigger plans at play than any of these people are aware of. And indeed, inside is stacks of cash. The other door is ceiling closed and the windows are shuttered by steel barricades. A worried Dennis encourages them that it's time to leave and they take his word for it, trying to make their way out but the walls keep shifting around. Two circles line up and a mechanism is triggered that opens the princess's cube. Moss chuckles that he was joking about before looking nervous and backs right into a door just as it slams closed, slicing him clean in half. Jeez, let me turn down the power on those doors, Cyrus. Don't think they necessarily need to be at insta-sliced-in-half power. That is a lot of 
of power is all I'm saying. Back in the room where Arthur specifically told his kids to stay put, they've left to his dismay. Maggie remarking, they're kids, what did you expect? Bobby is busy wheeling around on his razor and through his recorder hears another mysterious voice calling out to him to come downstairs. Meanwhile, sister is getting a bath going, which looks nice and relaxing, but when peering through the glasses, we see the walls are splattered in blood. The princess appears behind her, mimicking her actions of fixing her hair. Kathy flings open the curtain, and the third circle starts up, seeing a complex intertwined series of mechanics, causing more windows to shutter and doors to move. In the tub, it's filled with blood and the princess, but Kathy sees nothing, excited to try it out and totally oblivious. She splashes some water on her face, again with a big dumb smile, the water then turning to blood, seeing I'm sorry written in it on the floor. The princess screams, about to strike, just as her dad comes in knocking and they vanish. He's annoyed that she left, but she's still all stoked about the bathroom. What about Bobby? Maggie is all, oh yeah, he was just with me, but you know, not anymore. Arthur annoyed, as is her job to watch them. Dang, this guy really needs to do a better job keeping track of his kids. I probably would have fired Maggie at this point, to be fair. Thanks for nothing. Oh, I'm paying you to look after my kid and they just vanish under your watch? Yeah, doesn't exactly inspire confidence in your abilities. Bobby passes more doors that open and hears that same voice telling him to come down and play. He starts descending down until another voice tells him to stay upstairs and don't follow her. Arthur decides he's gonna find his boy himself and wants everyone else to wait in the car, but they're stopped in their tracks by the front door being sealed up. He takes a chair to it that only shatters it, having no effect whatsoever on the glass. Dennis grumbles, well that was dramatic, and he's certain that there is no way out, as he's already looked. The whole house is completely sealed up. Arthur demands Dennis tag along until they find Bobby, Maggie asking if the lawyer split, <laughs> which is funny because he was cut in half. More lovers crank, guiding Bobby deeper down into more rooms. A girl in a prom dress appears, the bound woman or Susan Legro. She led a privileged life, her parents the richest in town, and that plus being on the cheerleading squad made her the most popular girl at school. During her senior year, she dated the captain of the football team, Chet. He caught her with another boy on prom night and clubbed him to death before tying Susan up and strangling her with his tie, breaking her neck. He buried her body at the football field. Seeing her causes Bobby to flip, howling, and he puts his pedal to the metal, stopped by another wall. He spies a head on the ground, the rest of the body not far behind, the quite creatively nicknamed the torso. In life, Jimmy Gambino was a big gambler and spent his days at the tracks instead of school. He later opened his own booking business, but had difficulty making payoffs because of his compulsive gambling and developed a reputation due to his refusal to turn down a bet. This caught the attention of a mobster, Larry the Finger Vitello, who made a big bet on a boxing match. Jimmy agreed to it, and of course, his fighter was defeated, causing him to faint upon learning this. When he awoke, Larry and his gang arrived to collect what he owed, but with no way to actually pay them back, they instead cut up Jimmy's body, wrapped the pieces in cellophane, and dumped them in the ocean. Everyone else is searching for him, yelling his name, Dennis telling them don't waste their breath, as it's all ecto-proof glass, and knows a bit more about what all the writing is. They are containment spells that ghosts cannot cross. The supernatural realm has its own set of laws. For ghosts, it's spells. They have to obey whatever the words say. Kathy laughing in disbelief. They come to more writing on the ground, hidden barrier spells, according to Dennis. Arthur isn't having it. Tell him to cut out the haunted house shit. About to head down into the basement. Dennis stops him. Are you listening? There's ghosts down there, dude. Right, but you said they're locked up. Dennis is unwavering and going down until Arthur offers him a deal. He'll pay him whatever Cyrus owes if he helps. He scoffs. <laughs> Unbelievable. It orders him to step aside. Bobby comes to, hearing the same voice telling him to get out of the basement, noticing that it's actually coming through over his tape recorder. They tell him to put on the glasses, and he sees it's his mom, all burned up and toting an IV. We really don't have too much more to her backstory, referred to as the withered lover, except that the fire was caused by a rogue log that rolled out of the fireplace and set the Christmas tree ablaze. She later died of her injuries at the hospital. She keeps repeating to go upstairs and warns to watch out. He turns seeing Cyrus there, who slams his hand on the glass. The others come across more ghosts wandering around, including the prince whacking the glass with his bat. Arthur suggests they split up, and Maggie complains about having to go with Dennis, seeing another ring is starting to rotate. She still doesn't get it, since she can't see anything without the glasses, but Dennis has more pressing concerns. Confused, while all of the doors are opening up, he turns back and gets a scare from a massive ghost with railroad spikes in his head, the Hammer or George Markley. He was once a hardworking blacksmith until a man wrongfully accused him of theft and threatened banishment. Knowing that he was innocent, he stood up to him and refused to leave, resulting in the man Nathan and his gang beating his wife and children to death. Understandably pissed, George paid him back by brutally slaying all of 
killed them to death with his sledgehammer. When the town discovered what he did, they dragged him to his shop and tied him to a tree where they drove railroad spikes into his body, slowly killing him. As a final touch, they cut off his hand and affixed his hammer in its place. Maggie dons the glasses, stammering, it's the ghost, to Dennis's delight. Finally, a believer. He goes on that ghosts are in fact around us all the time and generally can't hurt us or even want to. However, there are exceptions like the hammer and pretty much everyone else here. Those that die a violent death stay at a tortured realm. So violence is all they know. More psychic flashes enter his mind. What appears to be him getting violently slammed around and appearing to die. Well, that's not good. They come to an open door that Dennis recognizes to his horror as the jackals. If he's out, screw the kid. It is time to go. Elsewhere, Kathy and Arthur find the recorder and glasses left behind by Bobby. She starts considering that maybe Dennis is right. Arthur interjecting, there's no such thing as ghosts. A quick peek in the glasses proves otherwise. The jackal appearing, dragging her down the hall. She's lifted up the wall, getting scratched in a flurry by his claws. Where is it? Arthur shouts, trying to grab at her legs. Kalina appears with a flare and tosses it, causing the ghost to drop Kathy and vanish. About to ask who the heck she is, he's all, ah, forget it, just pull, damn it! Elsewhere, Dennis and Maggie encounter Billy, trying to cautiously approach him. While the jackal gets trapped behind the glass, the princess shows up, Dennis telling Maggie when to move to avoid her. Now they have a moment to breathe, and he again asks who the heck she is, informing that she's in the spirit recollection business or freeing trapped souls. She tells Kathy to give him the glasses, and he finally sees for himself looking slack-jawed. She calls them one of Cyrus's many victims, who has a nasty habit of trapping souls. He's more interested in how she got in, saying she slipped through when the house shifted, but it's closed and won't happen again. She fills him in on what Cyrus's master plan is all about, showing off a book called The Arcanum, written in the 15th century by astrologer Basilius, while under the influence of demonic possession. It details the making of a machine that can see into the future. And indeed, that is the massive ornate thing at the center of the house, designed by the devil and powered by the dead. Arthur is single-minded on helping his family, but she rebuffs. If he wants her help, he's got to help her first. He turns to ask Kathy if she can walk, but she has mysteriously vanished. He's adamant that he's not going anywhere without them. Try telling that to him, she says, pointing at Arrow Boy looming and watching nearby. Mechanisms start worrying again, everything moving around once more. Things are getting tighter and tighter where Maggie and Dennis are, and he winds up trapped on the other side of the glass. Good job, he tells her sarcastically. Several of the ghosts appear, Maggie using the glasses to guide him where to go to avoid their attacks. The walls again move, allowing him to do a sweet roll under it before it closes right behind him. He looks to see if the coast is clear, and it seems to be at least, until he gets another psychic interruption, coming to a big baby and his tiny mama. Margaret, the dire mother, grew up to only be three feet in height and could never stand up for herself. That's kind of a bad pun. That's terrible. Due to her small size and was constantly poked fun of. Hopeful for acceptance, she joined Jimbo's Carnival. Ah, uh, carnies. They're the most accepting of them all. But it turned out to be just as bad. One night while cleaning up, another freak called the Tall Man sexually assaulted her and later gave birth to Harold. She never stopped spoiling him as he grew, leading to him remaining in diapers his entire life as well as having the mental acuity of a child. One day, the circus workers kidnapped her as part of a cruel joke and stuffed her into a sack where she suffocated. After his mother's death, Harold went into a rage-filled search for her and ransacked most of the carnival, but discovered that she was already dead. He then went nuts and killed all those responsible with an axe, as well as some other freaks who were just kind of standing around, I guess, and put their remains on display for others to see. When Jimbo found out about what he did, he ordered a mob to execute him. They nervously back up and run into Kalina, startling them. The doors change and the hammer cell is opened. Arthur gets a move on to climb up. The ghost just missing him. Kalina asked him to follow after, hearing the ghost cackling everywhere now in the corridors, holding them back with the flare it seems. Seeing this is for certain, when the jackal reappears and she tosses it, causing him to instantly vanish. Another lady in stockades comes at them, our pilgrimess, Isabella Smith. She sailed to New England in colonial times for a better life, but that didn't go so well as the townsfolk didn't trust outsiders. When the town's livestock began to die mysteriously, she was accused of witchcraft by a local preacher. She denied any wrongdoing, but when the preacher fell ill, the town turned against her and chased her down into a barn. They lit it on fire, but surprisingly, she emerged completely unscathed. So she was a witch after all. No matter, they locked her up in the stockades where children threw stones at her, the others cursing and spitting on her until she died of starvation weeks later. I guess even if you're a witch, you still gotta eat, huh? Babies or what have you. They make it past another wall that closes before she can get through. Dennis groaning, he hates this job. They blame Dennis for everything. You helped him with his wacky ghost business. How could you not know what it was all for? But Dennis confesses that he has his reasons. As maybe you've noticed, he 
he's a bit of a freak, the whole psychic thing, and that when he touches dead people, he goes into seizures. And if he touches someone alive, their lives flash by instead. Cyrus, he says, was one of the few who actually accepted him. Arthur firing back, he used you. And there is at least one major secret Dennis has been hiding. Kalina bringing up the fourth ghost, AKA Jean, which blows Arthur's mind. My wife's spirit is trapped in the house? Dennis defends that he didn't know either of them at the time, but Arthur is furious, socking him good, demanding to know why she was chosen. He croaks it was Cyrus that handpicked them all. Luckily for them, Kalina has a plan to save her and the kids too. It goes on to reveal the grand purpose of the Basilius machine. It is an exact recreation of his design, which utilizes 12 earthbound spirits with corresponding symbols for each. Together, they represent the so-called Black Zodiac, and it's by uniting them together that the machine can be turned on. Once all 12 are released, as we've been seeing happening all night, they are then drawn towards the center, each adding its individual energy to power it up. For what? The Ocularis Infernum, the knowing eye of hell. In hell, there is an eye that can see everything, past, present, and future, even heaven and earth. And she considers that if knowledge is power, the man who controls it would be the most powerful man on earth, AKA what Cyrus's whole life work was about with the house and the ghosts and everything, to essentially become a god. Well, too bad he's dead, huh? So far, 11 ghosts have been released, and that leaves just one more. But Dennis remembers that mention of a 13th from Damon. According to Kalina, the 13th ghost actually as a failsafe and will stop the machine entirely. The machine, it turns out, needs a sacrifice of love and of a broken heart. It can only be a ghost created out of pure love. Dennis all, oh man, Arthur, you gotta be the 13th ghost, bro. As the eye to hell opens, the power of his life will short circuit the system. Even Maggie points out that she's not so sure about this one, calling it suicide. But Kalina hammers it home that in order to save his kids, he's gonna have to trade his life for theirs. Dennis too thinks this all sounds a bit strange, but hey, what hasn't sounded strange this whole night, you know? And as far as Arthur is concerned, all that matters is his kids. He'll do anything. Dennis offering to tag along. Addressing Kalina, he asks if she's sure that she can stop the machine. Yep, she's gonna plant a whole bunch of explosives everywhere and take the whole house down in the process. Well, that'll work. Maggie is losing it, thinking they're going to get themselves killed. But Arthur finds a way to get some protection, at least, using a piece of a wall as a shield between them and the spooks. The girls go down first to buy them some time. Maggie complaining that she just just got her nails done. Downstairs, more levers clank, and mechanics whir, and the prince goes at him with his bat, smashing at the glass. They go for a ramming speed maneuver in return. Cyrus appears behind Maggie, but the flare isn't working. Hmm, isn't he supposed to be dead? Why wouldn't it work? Kalina conks her in the back of the head with the arcanum, coming face to face with him. Yet when she removes her glasses, he's still there. Dun dun dun! Cyrus is alive the whole time. Got you fools. Going in for a big smoochy poo, and they're dating. Woo, okay, wow. That's quite a type you got there. Kalina. Now we also know Kalina can't be trusted, so I'm sure her whole plan is actually what they want, not intending to save the day as she told them. She sounds like quite a loyal lackey, as it turns out she even killed Damon to steal his spells, but an important one, it appears, is missing. But don't worry, she's got the recordings and everything, worried that she's mad at him. Of course not, he grumbles. Yep, you let me down, lackey, no more smooches from Cyrus for you. Dennis gets another flash, and the hammer enters, while the final door opens, unleashing the killer juggernaut. Dennis is cornered, and they descend upon him. The hammer slams him down on the back with his hammer, and both start tossing him around violently. That much earlier premonition of his coming true. Well, that sucks. You see your own death, and then it just happens anyway. Thanks for nothing, psychic powers. It's all over when he's lifted in the air, and his back is snapped on a corner, his body thudding lifeless to the ground, the ghost laughing. Cyrus is confident Arthur will still sacrifice himself, and there is still more work to be done. Putting on a record of the drawing chanting spell, the final layer starts to spin on the ground. Each spirit is drawn to the machine, vanishing from the basement one by one. Jean appears to Arthur, telling him she loved him so much. He sobs back, he misses her, and is nothing without her. She's then whisked away, Arthur breaking down completely. Leaving the room, Cyrus cranks another lover, trapping Kalina on the other side, her baffled asking, what are you doing? He coldly reminds her, greatness requires sacrifice, and she's squished to death between the walls. Dang, Cyrus, you cold-blooded. Smooch him and smooch him, huh? <laughs> That's such a stupid joke. Uh, anyway, Arthur makes it to the machine, its layers wildly spinning in formation around the center, from which Kathy and Bobby appear tied up, seeing the massive swirling red eye of hell down below. He dons the glasses, seeing the whole ghost gang in formation on their respective symbols. Then looking over, sees his uncle, appearing quite menacing with an appropriate lightning crash. He reminds him of his plan, and each of the ghosts representing the Black Zodiac and all that stuff, counting through each and every one reaching 12. He brings up what Dennis said about him, but thinks about it, if I'm the 13th, 
Wait a minute. And he removes his glasses. Yep, n not dead. You son of a bitch, he growls and runs for him, roughing him up, demanding he releases his kids. He fires back. He's nothing and a loser. He dedicated his life to this and fights back with wallops from his mighty cane. He pulls a sword from it and tells him that he doesn't have a choice and must make the leap. The machine needs a ghost created out of true love, revealing that's why he chose him and his pathetic family. Congratulations, you get to become the 13th ghost, but not so fast as the chanting on the recording becomes distorted, sounding like someone scratching a record. And see, it's Maggie in the control room messing with stuff. She pulls off the reel and the ghosts all disappear, her then moving on to erratically pulling on the levers. All this messing about causes the machine to go haywire, starting to get caught up in its own mini gears. All the ghosts reappear and go after Cyrus. He screams insanely and they toss him into the machine's blades, chopping him up real good. Then his ghost appears, encouraging him that he can finish this. You still have the power in you. you Use it to go save your kids. Arthur stares intently at the machine, trying to figure out the pattern and when to jump. The piece is moving all over the dang place. A gear shoots off, shattering a wall, and Arthur makes his triumphant slow-mo leap into the middle, making it right through the blades as the house starts to explode. Keep your heads down, he yells, the walls shattering everywhere. And then it suddenly stops. It's all over. The ghosts are all seen outside, now free, and wandering off into the night, disappearing. Hey, they got freed after all. Good for them. Dennis looks on pleased, and he too dissolves away. See you guys, I'm off to a better place, playing Shaggy and Scooby-Doo next year. Don't grieve for me, it's my destiny. Jean appears on her symbol, her skin now unburned, and tells him she loves him before disappearing in the wind. Undercutting this quite emotional family moment is Maggie with more sass. Declaring this is it for her with this nanny shit, she's on the first plane back to New York. This wasn't on the job description, I quit. And oh boy, it goes right into a tasty hip hop track with some 2001 beats. Well, wait, wait, hold on a minute. I just had an epiphany. I literally have seen this so many times over the years and never even thought about it until right now. The end song has to be by Raw Digger, right? Oh my God, that makes so much sense. Oh, yep. It is, no offense, but holy shit, that is some goofy stuff. In the same grand tradition as LL Cool J appearing in Deep Blue Sea and the infamous My Hat is Like a Shark Fin end credits tune. Ha, <laughs> the early 2000s. Well, technically Deep Blue Sea was 99, but you know what I mean. Again, there's just something about the overall vibe of horror movies from that era. I can't quite put my finger on it. Roll it! Ah, let's go. Trying to figure out why I captivate people when I don't even trust Like all the things that I took for granted But no mirror, mirror on the wall Who gonna survive, who be next to fall It might be today, it might be tomorrow that brings us to the conclusion of this in-depth explained video on 13 Ghosts. It's honestly nowhere near the best horror movie around or anything, but this one does have quite a few things going for it that do make it special. Certainly gets that nostalgia going. What about Ghost Ship, anyone, around the same time? Uh, that was the same director as this, actually. Anyway, before we go, don't forget you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. And just like with this one, don't worry, I get them. It just takes me a long-ass time to finally get around to it. Thanks for all the requests, guys. What do you guys think of 13 Ghosts and its ending? What's your favorite later 90s, early 2000s horror flick? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.